So we're going to cover getting rid of the dad bod, getting out of going from out of shape to in shape, strategies you can use, things to avoid, all of that based on our experience coaching and doing it ourselves as well. And I know, Mona, I think you wanted to define what a dad bod is first. And maybe you should add, just like kind of like the bullshit uh, magazines say, do you find dad bods attractive? <laughs> Why are you asking me that? Know, that's what the magazines say. So I'm, I'm asking a, a woman's perspective. Mm, no. Um, so, again, this is individual because I do know some woman who does love that kind of body. And that's actually with the definition now that you'll see um, why I say that. Now, the definition of a dad bot that most people know is it's normally the middle-aged man um, that's got a physique that is slightly overweight or it's got that soft appearance. Um, or even like Gara said, you know, the beer belly, um, especially around the midsection. And the individual may not maintain a strict exercise routine, but isn't severely out of shape either. So, for example, they will probably train every now and again, now and again, and get into like routines. But then they're also very quick to fall off the bandwagon. Now, the thing that is quite interesting is like what I saw is like there's some cultures that actually celebrate the dad bod. So for them, it's probably like a you know, you are a working man now, you've got kids, so they see it as like, it's a really good thing. And then they also see it as, you know, um, that that's probably the type of woman that will also really like her man having the dad bod, because it will probably portray maybe a certain thing, you know. And then, um, but then on the other hand, there's others that see it as you are letting yourself go. Um, and I think for most people, it's, the second one you know you've kind of let yourself go so now the dad bod has appeared yeah and another way of looking at it is that skinny fat look i guess being skinny on the limbs but holding holding a fair amount of body fat as you mentioned around the midsection or around most places so i actually wrote a post yesterday covering the 10 commandments to shred the dad bod for good. Um, I think Mona's got even more to add to it. This was just 10, and obviously um, there's a lot more you can add to this too. But we'll kind of run through it. No particular order, and we'll add kind of more detail to each one. And also Mona will add some more detail as well through her perspective too, through her years of coaching and training, etc. But the first one I had here was to stop skipping breakfast. And obviously the big trend right now well, not right now, I mean, for the past how long? Intermittent fasting, don't eat breakfast, wait till later. Um, cool, sure, it, obviously it can work, uh, but all those diets work in the same way, and that is you're eating less food or consuming less calories than you're using, creating a caloric deficit, and that doesn't matter whether it's intermittent fasting, carnivore, keto, vegan, whatever it is, you're removing something, and by removing something, you are consuming less calories than you normally would. And hence, people see successful weight loss. However, you can run into some issues where if it doesn't fit your lifestyle, it doesn't make sense. And often people who go through things like not eating breakfast <laughs> tend to get so hungry by whatever time it is, it kind of offsets what's happening anyway. Um, and if you are more on the performance aspect of things, for example, I know Ryan's in here. I know he's a he's an avid CrossFitter now. And if you're training in the evening or in the afternoon, skipping breakfast, even when you make up those calories later in the day at lunchtime, you still see drops in performance in the afternoon and evening. So bear that in mind that skipping breakfast, okay, cool, might be a way to create a calorie deficit initially and make it easier for you, but you will see performance reductions in the afternoon if you're looking to lift well, train well, et cetera, in those situations. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, I prefer starting the day off with a high-protein breakfast. It could be things like eggs, oats, uh, fruit, um, all those things that sit well in your stomach and just avoiding high-sugary you know, cereals and milk and low-protein breakfast that leave you hungry an hour later or spiking that sugar and then getting that big uh, drop, like making you feel sluggish a little later. Have you got anything to add to that, Mona? Um, what, to the breakfast, you mean? Yep, to the not skipping breakfast. 
uh, yeah, no, I think definitely that is one of the most important things because I feel like if you can set yourself up for success for the day, you often find that people actually eat a lot better as well. And, you know, I've seen this like time and time out again with clients and stuff like that. Um, you know, as soon as they add a breakfast, a healthy high protein breakfast into their diet, you'll see that even they are, they'll be setting this, themselves up for like a successful lunch, a successful dinner, because they also now feel good. So they won't go and binge eat and go and stop at like a donut shop or a Starbucks or something like that, where they can just grab anything and everything um, because they're just so hungry and their body is just craving, you know, everything. So, um, you know, the best thing that they can do is set themselves up for success in the morning already. And I bet that will already start to make a difference. Um, and remember, it's not going to be easy in the beginning. So, you know, starting small, even if it's just like you mentioned, just having some eggs and stuff like that, that's just high protein, even if it's a small breakfast at first, um, you know, falling into like a new routine or new habits, it, it does take time and it does take work and it does take you being mindful of what you're putting into your body. But before you know it, it will become a habit. And you will see that you will wake up and your body will actually crave that high protein breakfast. Yeah. And if anyone wants to jump up and ask a question or speak at all, just request to speak and then uh, raise your hand and we can bring you up too. But I want to go on to point number two. And I think it is the number one, for me, the number one factor why people fail at a lot of the stuff. And it's the all or nothing approach. And it's the idea that when people start, these things of, hey, I want to get in better shape, I want to lose body fat, I want to gain muscle, whatever it is, they go all or nothing. And that means the perfect gym routine, they're training five days a week, the perfect diet, everything is tracked, everything is done to perfection. And then as soon as a mistake happens or they feel like something else, maybe they want a cookie or something and they have a cookie or whatever, now it's suddenly, oh, I'm not on the diet or on the plan anymore. That means I can do whatever I want. And because I had this cookie, oh, everything's ruined. So I'm just going to go and eat now pizza for dinner, a whole pizza, and then I'm going to have cheesecake afterwards, et cetera. And then, oh, maybe I'm not going to train the next day and I'll start again next week. And that all or nothing approach will crush everything you do. Um, and it's important that you see things as a consistency approach versus an all or nothing approach. And for example, say you've, decided you're going to train three times a week and you're going to tighten up your diet somehow and you high protein, et cetera. And then one evening you decide, you know, I really feel like a little bit of ice cream or cookie and you do that. That's fine. You're not going to run into any, run in, into any problems long term. And even if you do feel like you're going to do something like that, you can adjust for that within your day. So if you know that evening you're going to have, oh, I want you know, a couple hundred calories of ice cream, you can remove those couple hundred calories earlier in the day from carbohydrates and fat, for an example. And that way you're making room for it in your diet there. So you're planned for it. Um, and that way you're not going to be in this approach where you're like, okay, I had ice cream. That means my diet or plan is ruined. I'm going to continue on that same track and finish the whole pint or whole container and then add something else on top. And that stuff will completely destroyed the efforts that you're putting in. Mona, you got more to add to that too? Yeah, I. sorry, I'm just having a very active little baby here. Um, <laughs> but with the all or nothing approach, you know, I've spoken about this a lot. And I think the the biggest thing is, like you mentioned, is people go in, you know, balls to the walls and, you know, they think, oh my gosh, I'm going to stick to this. They're super motivated in the beginning. Um, but the thing is like, it's not, you're not always going to be motivated and you're not always going to wake up and be like, I'm going to crush this. Um, so the thing is you can't also always rely on motivation to make changes. And then on the other side of things is if you are that person who tends to want to do the all or nothing or whatever, um, you know, I do, I, I do tell them like reconsider that and rather start small and think of playing the long game. Um, think of the longevity. Think of, you know, is it going to be sustainable? And, for example, if you go from, you know, not training for years and years and years and all of a sudden you're like, man, I want to get back into training, you know, I always just recommend, okay, what's the first thing we can do? It's like, let's just start off with, like, 
10 minutes of training or 10 minutes of walking, um, adding slow and steady, you know, either exercises or activity to your daily lifestyle is going to be so much more sustainable in the long run. And then at the end of the day, you are going to not just get the results, but your results are going to, you know, be ongoing instead of just, you know, bang, you have now seen the beginner, the beginner person result. Um, oh my gosh, my dog. <laughs> I've got a dog and a yeah. baby. That's crazy. But um, yeah, so you won't just see that beginner athlete or beginner gym person uh, fast result. It's, it's actually going to um, be a lot more sustainable. Yeah, no, for sure. And that, and that brings us to point number three out of our 10, lifting heavy. And again, I think you can do everything that we're going to say today, diet-wise, being more active and stuff. But if you're not lifting weights, uh, you won't see the change. And that's just the unfortunate truth behind it. You have to combine everything we're doing with lifting. And there's a reason for that. The first one is if you have a dad bod or ask any fat, it, you have a lack of muscle mass. And for you to change the way you look, it's not about losing belly fat. Because if you just lose more belly fat, fat, you just end up even skinnier. You need to lift weights to recomp, especially if you already have that type of body, you will more likely recomp, meaning you will build muscle and lose fat simultaneously. Obviously, if you're more advanced, that's less likely. But if you have this type of body, you'll likely fall into the uh, the more beginner or you'll be more likely to recomp in that sense. So making sure that you're actually lifting, and that can be a minimum of twice a week. Twice a week, two times full body sessions, that's enough for you to get started. If you have more time or want to do more, you can. Obviously, three, four times a week splits, you've got multiple options. You can do full bodies, upper lowers. If you have even more time, you can do push-pull legs. Um, there's a lot you can do there, but you have to be lifting. And if you're not lifting, you will not see these changes. And no amount of cardio will get you there. In fact, I would uh, avoid doing intentional cardio outside of just normal phys physical activity in this case. Then everything should come from lifting and from the diet. Mona, what have you got to add to that? Or have you got uh, Mia and Eliko being crazy there? Yes, I've got both being crazy, so I did not listen to your last point. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. You're good. That's why I was just talking about lifting heavy, but we can jump on to jump on to the next point on limiting alcohol. And I think this is just more of a common sense one. I think most people know this. If you're already pounding, you know, twelve packs over the weekend or having multiple beers every night, yeah, you're adding hundred plus calories per drink every or every day or whatever per beer um and obviously that adds up and if you're trying to account for it and you're having multiple you're not gonna be able to eat anything that day because you're gonna basically dig up all your calories through alcohol uh, which is not a good thing um i don't think you have much to add to that mona outside of that's pretty much common sense yeah i did want to say you know as and and to like emphasis emphasize on the word limit like you don't have to go and cut it out um again that's that all or nothing approach um, you know, like you mentioned, if you have like five beers a day, um, you know, cut it down to like three beers a day or two beers a day, um, you know, start off making small adjustments. And what I would also then suggest is if you're a person that drinks high calorie drinks, um, switch over to some other low calorie options, you know, um, and just make small little changes. And then later on, you can be like, okay, I will have like, a drink once or twice a week um and i just won't go overboard yeah no that's a good point yeah you don't have to take it out completely if you love you know, if you love your alcohol but limiting it for example to one or two drinks maybe on the weekend or something like that instead of whole 12 packs yeah that's going to be a lot better for you um but my point number five here i've got find a way to be more active now i mentioned obviously I don't think you need, you shouldn't go do a lot of intentional cardio. Um, but just for general health, it's good to at least do something and be a little active. And I think this is a time when, you know, could you go on more walks with your, your family, your baby, your wife, son, daughter, whatever it is, or do you have a physical ho hobby that you do? These are things that will just kind of keep you active. And typically, if you're 
if you're doing, you know, some working with your family and things, it's also going to mean you don't need to cut as much food out of your diet um, as you originally thought. However, it doesn't mean, you know, go do a lot of endless cardio, but at least just being active is just good for general health and will help shed some pounds. You got anything to add to that, Mona? Yes, I was going to say that, you know, being, again, intentional about being active, like you mentioned, doing things with your kids, going for walks with your dogs. And if you don't have a kid or a dog, you know, just going for, you know, walks with like either your significant other or, you know, even by yourself, because I feel like going for those walks can actually be really good for your mind as well, because you can just kind of be one with nature. You can just take it as, you know, kind of a reset. You can take it as a stress reliever. And I feel like, you know, we fall into the trap of just always being on our phones. Um, so we are active. We go for walks, but we end up going for walks with our phones in our hand. And we end up, you know, um, taking calls and doing business and everything. I feel like, you know, people should be more intentional about putting their phone away and doing those kind of things with our technology um just taking it as you know you doing a little mindful walk even if it's for like 15 or 30 minutes you'll also find that if you are doing that with someone um you guys will probably have a lot more to talk about as well and it's not just you and your partner walking and you know sitting on your cell phones um, because i feel like that kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing that as well yeah which actually brings us perfectly to the next point Mona, is get a workout partner and it doesn't have to be another dad or anything like that um it can be your significant other your wife uh, i know Mona and i we often train together in the garage so that's something just to be kind of think about you know you can if you like your, your alone time training perfect you know this is this tip you don't need to worry about but i think sometimes it can be helpful if you know you're tired from looking after the kids and you know whatever else work etc and you don't feel like going to the gym that day but you have you know your wife or work a partner you've already planned to train that day you know you kind of have to go or whatever it is because you've already planned that so those things can, they, those things can keep you on track uh, when you don't feel like doing it, because as Mona mentioned, you know, your motivation isn't going to be sky high every day. It will be in the first three days, and then it's going to taper off quickly. And by that fourth, fifth day, you're going to be like, do I really want to go? And that is why having a partner can be helpful. Mona, you got more to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, finding a partner is, you know, it will definitely help with keeping you accountable. However, the the there is the con as well that sometimes if you have a workout partner and your workout partner says oh let, let's skip today and you're like oh okay you know I'll, I'll skip today um so make sure that you get someone who is you know also going or working towards a goal maybe working towards something that they want to achieve in their life um but again if you don't have that person and you have a training partner who does flake every now and then now and again i feel like you just need to also have that mindset of, you know, if it does happen, it doesn't mean that I have to flake as well. Like still go into the gym and still do your workout, even if you don't have a workout partner. Um, and that again is just going to be that dedication from like, how badly do I want to change my body? How badly do I want to achieve my goals? Mona, you've been doing great segues through my points. You don't even know what my points are. This is good. Point number seven for me that I have here is having a strong why. And losing weight, seeing your scale weight go down, fitting your clothes better, et cetera, are not strong wise. They do not count. If you go into doing something like this and your reason for it is, I just want to lose weight, I just want to look better, I just want my clothes to fit better, et cetera, none of those will keep you, none of those will keep you on track when things get harder or you start to lose motivation. And I'm telling you that now from experience, from myself, from coaching other people, et cetera, it's just not enough to keep you going. You need something way stronger to keep you on track. And it's got to be something, I guess, emotionally or internally driven. And that's got to be things, you know, is it to lead your family, be a role model for your kids? Do you have, a, do you have maybe parents or grandparents or a family history of a certain disease that you're trying to avoid? These are the things that are stronger drivers than, you know, I just want to lose weight or I just want to get big, et cetera. Um, 
Mona, I know psychology is your area of expertise. I'm sure you've got a lot to add. Actually, I was going to say you were like spot on with what you were saying now about having that why. And, you know, that again is going to help you when things do get tough and you don't have the motivation to train um, because at the end of the day, you know, go and... This space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today. You know, internally look at like why you want to do it. And if you often, if you're that person who wakes up and you doubt, you know, you're like, man, I don't feel like training. If, you know, write down your why. Write down, you know, take a, you know, a book. And I know, you know, uh, like the gratitude journals and stuff like that has been really big recently. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if a lot of men do it. But if you don't, then that's also fine. You know, I, I have a big calendar that's like literally in my little office. And I write like a motivational quote, like, on my little calendar and I feel like if you can do that too and just constantly see it then you're going to wake up and you're going to see that why and once you see it you're going to remember also like okay I'm doing this because of like you mentioned I might want to avoid you know having heart disease in the future or you know whatever it could be Um, or I'm doing it because I want to live longer. I want to be able to play with my kids. I want to be able to, you know, climb a tree with my kid or do a handstand with them. Um, And I don't want to, you know, when I'm 40, be so out of shape that I can't even do anything. And I feel like, you know, at the end of the day, like if you don't take action now, then you're going to regret it in the long run. Um, So if you know that you are that person that, I've been sitting with that, you know, for quite some time. And you've been saying to yourself, man, I need to start working out. I need to start working out. Like, take what we are saying now as like a nudge to be like, okay, I need to start right now. Yeah. Yeah, Mona hit those points perfectly on there. And we've kind of touched on this already, but I'm going to bring it up again for point number eight, and that's consistency. So we talked about the all or nothing approach earlier. The all or nothing approach my opinion, the number one thing that will kill anything you do trying to get in shape, lose your dad, Bob, whatever it is. If you go all or nothing into your diet and training, you will fail. That's 100%. 100%. No one can stick to something perfectly for a long time. And that is why consistency is key with losing your dad, Bob. And that means, that doesn't mean being perfectly consistent. It means being consistently good. And you will never have days in a row of perfect training sessions or perfect dietary um, adherence. And I know Mona obviously has been an elite athlete for 20 plus years. How many times Mona have you had the most perfect training session um, in a week or even within a month? How often does that happen? I was literally just going to say like sometimes it's months and I don't have like a really good training session. Um, But then what I, ended up doing later on you know instead of just focusing on results 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 I've been focusing on you know the process and going into the gym and being like okay this is my goal for my training session and walking out of the training and even though if I didn't hit my numbers or whatever I still try and take something positive out of it Um, but it's true what you're saying you know it's not always going to be nice it's not always going to you know feel good and it's not always going to be like oh my gosh, I hit a new personal record or, you know, like, oh my gosh, I can see, oh, my little one just fell over, <laughs> um, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to give it over to Jane. Yep, <laughs> yep, me is being a little crazy there, um, but we've got another point, I've, I've touched on this as well, so like about stopping fad diets, again, carnivore, intermittent fasting, vegan, keto, they all work the same way, there is no superior benefit to doing any of these diets over a normal, regular diet. I guess diet or calorie deficit. They all work exactly the same way. There's nothing special about them. Um, so just do what fits your lifestyle and what you like to do. Don't try and just conform to a certain diet because some dumbass on Twitter is talking about how this does the certain thing when it doesn't. Because there's a whole lot of people on on X or Twitter or wherever saying shit, and they're just wrong and they're actually dumb fucks. So don't follow them and don't listen to whatever they are saying. I think Mia is still being crazy in the background there. Um, but we'll go on to point number 10. I know we've got a couple of bonus ones too, but cardio should be the last thing you add 
to your training plan to finally reach whatever point you want to. In fact, a lot of times you don't even need to add it, but it can be helpful. Um, and it can be something that, you know, if your food is getting too low or you don't want to cut any more food, then you can start to add some cardio. But this is way down the line. And by cardio is typically something low intensity, like walking on a tre- inclined treadmill kind of thing, or maybe you're doing more of your physical activity or hobby. Um, it doesn't have to be anything crazy like doing some um, high intensity interval sprints and whatever else. So that should be the last thing you think about adding to your program. You don't need to do it, um, which is probably helpful for a lot of people that don't like doing it. But I know there's a lot of people that kind of jump into, oh, I'm going to lose weight, so I'm just going to start going running. And that's the exact opposite of the way you should approach things. Um, it should be in the gym, lifting, dietary stuff, and then add cardio later on. Um, Mona, you, you are able to speak there. I think Mia's still crazy, isn't she? Uh Yep, she's still crazy, but um, I can add, do you want me to add some other points that I have? Yep, go for it. Okay, so what I wanted to add is like, you know, one thing that people, again, with like living the, you know, on the go, busy lifestyle is people don't eat mindfully. And I mean, like we fall into that trap too, like James and I, like, you know, we'll often like we'll eat and we'll be on our phones and watch YouTube videos and like watch TV or whatever. But you know, eating mindfully um, will also help you to not just like stuff anything and everything into your mouth um, and actually like sitting and chewing your food and being with your family, um, you know, being with your being with your loved ones. Like that makes a big uh, difference as well, um, because the thing is, a lot of people will go and they'll be like on the go and like in their car, they'll, you know, stop quickly at like a subway or like, you know, a Chick-fil-A or whatever. Um And they'll just like get something and eat it and just be like, okay, I'm just wanting to fill my stomach. But at the end of the day, you know, they a lot of times they'll end up like eating a whole bunch of fats. So what will happen is they'll feel super lethargic. So they're like, okay, let me drink more coffee. And, you know, at the end of the day, they'll have like 10 coffees or like how many energy drinks and, you know, just eating really bad. And they just feel really crap all the time. And when they feel like that, that's also when people are like, well, I'm feeling like crap anyways. Like I'm just going to, you know, tonight have another burger or have a pizza. And they just fall into that trap of just being like, next month I'm going to start or next week I'm going to start or on Monday I'm going to start, um, you know. And that all has to do with just, you know, and like I was saying, you know, just find a little time, like even if it's during a day, like 10 minutes or so, and then take your meal and just mindfully eat it. And then also that gets me to the point of like, I know this might be hard for like some people, but actually preparing your own food or meal prepping. If you go on like a Sunday, like you and your significant other, or or just if it's just you, you know, actually meal prepping a whole bunch of like, it could be ground beef or it can be, you know, uh, some steaks or chicken or whatever it is, you know, like preparing some meals so that you can take it to work, that will also give you a lot more control of what you're putting into your body. And then also you won't fall into the excuse of, oh, but I'm hungry and Chick-fil-A was the closest. Um, you know, I feel like that's one of the, the important things as well. I don't know, James, if you want to yeah. add something to that. that that's, a, that's a good point about being prepared. Obviously, if you have nothing in your fridge to eat and you need to cook it from scratch, you're going to go for something that's easier. So having stuff already cooked and ready to go and planning those meals is going to make it easier. But for anyone who's joined and listening, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to jump on stage as well and ask any questions too. We also have a little gift on our Lift Big Eat Big profile. You'll see a link there in the bio. It takes you to the first step of our three-step process. Essentially, it gets you losing five plus pounds in the first week um, very easily without doing much else. And I'll give you that one or one of the tips now and that is literally swapping high calorie or calorie condiments and drinks for the zero calorie versions and people be like oh no but then you're drinking diet soda and you're having artificial this and that honestly these people shut the fuck up um they have no clue (laughs) what's going on if you drink a lot of full sugar i guess drinks and you almost have I wouldn't say have to. A lot of people find it hard to go cold turkey on that stuff. And you don't need to. Swap them out for the diet or zero sugar, zero calorie versions. It's going to help you stick 
to your plan without going off the rails and starting to drink your calories. And obviously drinking your calories, if you're looking to reduce your caloric intake, is the way to go. Uh, drinking calories typically, one, doesn't keep you full. And two, is almost think of it as, as a waste of your caloric budget because those 100, 200 calories that you drank, you could probably eat something that's going to be one, more nutritious, and two, actually fill you up. So bear that in mind regarding the diet and or regarding the sodas and things like that. Regarding condiments, there are easy ones to replace. If you're using things like um, full sugar, like ketchup, you're using mayonnaise and stuff like that, if, if you want zero-calorie condiments, hot sauces and a mustard – are both zero calories. So you can add those to your eggs, to your you know, meat and rice dishes, whatever else. And they're super helpful and they're tasty. If you want to, to go a little more broad, you can also go for lower fat op- lower fat options, low fat ranch, low fat mayo, all those things, if you portion them out properly, can reduce your caloric intake. Yes, they're not as quote unquote healthy, but you know what else is not healthy? Being fat. And that is far more uh, detrimental to your health than than having a little bit of sauce that has maybe some things in it that aren't ideal. So a bit bear those in mind. Those, that's really easy. That's step one in the three-step process just there. And if you go into the link in, in our bio there, it will take you to, you can download that three-step process book. Um, it actually runs you through the three steps, but that's the first one right there. Just make that one change and that will start, especially if you already have a lot of that stuff, that will start to change things immediately. Um, and as Mo said, we're about eating, eating mindfully too. You'll notice how certain foods make you feel. Uh, you'll know that after, for example, I know for myself, if I go out and I have certain foods that are typically higher in fat, higher in carbo- processed carbohydrates, you know, you know your typical burgers and going out, especially Mexican for me, oh my gosh, that shit will put me to sleep ASAP and I'll be full for the rest of the day. Um, you know, just know how these foods affect you. And maybe you look to avoid a lot of these foods during this process, or maybe they become more of a treat uh, versus being, you know, being eaten every weekend, et cetera. So that, so bear those in mind too. Um, Mona, you got any, any more to add? I think you had some more uh, tips written down on top of our 10 or 11 we've already given. Yeah. I just want to say, you know, like I feel, um, like something again that's really easy that people can do and especially with you know we want to get higher protein meals in or we want to get you know just how you know building muscle in general like especially if you go to the gym and you're like okay but how am I going to get in a lot more protein um and there's a lot of like really good healthy and clean protein drinks out there and you know even when I (laughs) even when I was even when I was pregnant, you know, I was really battling to get in meat. And, you know, if you're that kind of person who battles to get in meat, um, you know, I would suggest getting in either like a really good, like a whey protein isolate um, or even getting those uh, RTD drinks. Like we get really good ones at Costco, like the Fairlife ones. And um, normally there's a lot of like milk products that just makes me feel bloated and just not you know, I just, my stomach just doesn't agree with it. And I find that with like those fair light drinks, they are really good. And I think they're like 30 grams of protein, um, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah. Yeah, those, you... are, those are perfect, those drinks. If you're able to get those uh, protein RTDs and you're on the go, or even just protein powder and you're able to take that with you, yeah, that is, that's the one supplement. I mean, we'll touch on supplements after this, but that is the one supplement you should have in your cupboard. Yeah, and I feel like, I feel like it's so easy as well. Um, you know, that again, that will just add a quick little 30 grams of protein. But again, I suggest, you know, going and actually reading labels. Don't just see, oh, here's a protein drink at your supermarket and just take it. Because there are also ones with really just a whole bunch of junk in it. And they are actually really low in protein. So I would rather opt in for the ones that are high in protein um, because at the end of the day, it will just help you hit your protein goals, which will also help you if you do strength training, help you build muscle. um, And that's what we want to do as well. And it will just make you feel satisfied uh, because if you like think of it, like you can have like a little snack of like, you know, a bunch of like grapes or some fruit and you can have your protein drink and then if you want some fats with it as well you know have a little like a handful of nuts there's a really nice and easy snack to have that's not going to be messy it's not going to take a long time to eat um 
and it's you could, if you need to have something on the go like rather have something like that on the go yeah that's a good idea if anyone wants to jump in and ask any questions or speak feel free to put it in the comments or um request to speak but we'll jump down the supplement route um now mona and touch on supplements and we'll come back to the training stuff too but obviously supplements are the billion plus dollar industry everyone's trying to sell you the answers to getting rid of your dad bod or weight loss or fat loss. Unfortunately, there is no such thing. There's no such thing as a diet pill. There's no such thing as a supplement that will speed up your metabolism, quote unquote. There's no such thing as a supplement that will burn fat. There's, it's all marketing. And the only way for you to do that is through eating less than you, than you um, burn. And that's just how it is. So when we're talking about supplements for this purpose, though, there are some that can help. And there are some that I think you should take regardless of your goal. So whether that's building muscle, losing body fat. The first one, obviously, we talked about on protein powders. There are different kinds of protein powders. It does not matter which ones you take if you are hitting your daily protein intake. And your daily protein intake typically sits anywhere between 0.7, 0 0.8 grams per pound to one gram per pound of body weight per day. One gram of protein per pound of body weight per day is typically just easier to calculate and easier to keep track of. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you would eat around 200 um, grams of protein in that day. Now, obviously, if you are very obese or overweight, then you need to, uh, you can, instead of taking, for example, if, if you weigh 350 pounds, as an example, that's a lot of protein to take. It can be expensive. It can be hard to get down. In these instances, if you're typically that big, you hold a lot of body fat, you can actually use your height in centimeters as the as the uh, marker so if you are 180 centimeters tall and 350 pounds you would use 180 grams as your target and that can make things a little more bearable um and then regarding the, the supplements oh we actually got a question here on the comments any thoughts on arginine so l-arginine was a very popular ingredient in pre-workout if anyone remembers no explode um, and it was touted as a nitric oxide booster. So people would add L-arginine to things. Hey, it's going to increase blood flow, nitric oxide booster, you know, dilates blood vessels. You get more blood flow to the muscle. Hey, you're going to get better pumps, more endurance, et cetera. The only problem with L-arginine and why no one uses L-arginine anymore is because L-arginine doesn't or doesn't convert to nitric oxide well, because once it gets into the gut, it gets destroyed. So you don't actually get that conversion to nitric oxide to dilate the blood vessels. Instead, Companies are now using L-citrulline because what L-citrulline does, it's a precursor to L-arginine. So while you ingest the L-citrulline, uh, it gets broken down to L-arginine in the kidneys. And then from the kidneys, it's able to be turned into nitric oxide, improving uh, blood flow blood flow and um, blood vessel dilation. So L-arginine is not, some, not something that I think really has any efficacy or any kind of use, or at least within this context, um, L-citrulline would be a better supplement to take in that scenario um, and has been shown to improve quite a few endurance markers as well. You're typically taking six to eight grams 30 minutes to an hour before a workout with L-citrulline, but it's in most pre-workouts now anyway. But you'll find a lot of pre-workouts tend to be underdosed, so just bear that in mind, check the ingredients label. Um, but also back to our protein thing. So yeah, that's your protein intake. It doesn't matter what kind of protein in that instance. Whey protein typically spikes muscle protein synthesis or the building of new protein highest um, immediately after after a workout. However, in the long term, in the long run, it doesn't matter as long as you're hitting your dietary protein intake. So vegan protein, if you like vegan protein or you're lactose intolerant, um, beef protein, if you like that, but beef protein tends to have a, like a blood aftertaste a lot of the time. Um, those are all options. And within whey protein, obviously you've got whey protein concentrates, isolates, hydrolyzes, et cetera. Again, it doesn't matter. It just It's just one, if you have a sensitivity to dairy, whey isolates have less lactose or none at all. So they're typically better options for those people. It's also higher in protein since it's, uh, I think it's the way it's manufactured. It ends up being higher in protein. That's why you see a lot of whey concentrates. They tend to have, for example, 21, 22 grams of protein per 30 gram scoop. You want that protein number as close to the serving size as possible. So if you have a 30 gram scoop, you know you want 24 plus grams of protein typically, um, depending on the protein powder. Obviously, flavorings and other additives make that gap bigger. So better than mine. But yeah, protein works very well um, because it can be an easy snack. You can add it to your breakfast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's easily done. Now, regarding 
mass gainers as well, I think they can also be used in this context. And you think, okay, mass gainer, isn't that going to you know, make me add body weight and get fatter? No, again, it all comes to, down to caloric intake. So mass gainers can be used as a meal replacement if you're on the go. So high, if you have a very high um, calorie mass gainer, you can use less of it. But typically you're looking for something that has whole food sources so there's a couple of good i think redcon one does a really good one that's just whole food carbohydrate sources and protein sources and has a very good macro breakdown it's like 500 calories in a serving so it means you can take a 500 calorie meal replacement as a shake if you're on the go and you need something um so th those are those are good for this purpose obviously you have creatine creatine is the most misunderstood supplement i did a whole post on this on those for ebook uh twitter page or twitter profile breaking down how creatine works, how you should take it, etc. But essentially, creatine, you're saturating the muscle with creatine molecules. They bind with the phosphate that's floating around in there. And then that gives you readily available energy for the muscles during high-intensity tasks. One, it's not going to make you gain a whole lot of weight. Two, it's not going to make you lose your hair. Three, it's not going to give you acne. Four, it's not going to make you cram. Five, it's not going to dehydrate you, etc. That's all bullshit. People who say that don't know shit about what they're talking about. Um, so take your creatine is going to help you in those instances. And outside of that, I mean, you can use a fish oil if you don't get much um, fatty fish in your diet. Outside of that, there's, there's pretty much nothing else that you need to take um, in this instance. If you want to take other things, vitamin D can be helpful, obviously, if you're deficient, and then other minerals, zinc, magnesium and stuff, if you're deficient. Um, and outside of that, there's not much else in terms of supplements. Um, Mona, I don't know if there's any other supplements you would want you think about adding to that list? Uh, you're on mute, Mona. Okay, sorry. Um, I was going to say, I think um, a good one to, to possibly uh, talk about, like from your side, is glutamine as well, because, you know, that used to be such a big one in the past. People used to love taking out glutamine for like muscle recovery. Um, so you're yeah, it, it doesn't do anything for muscle recovery and stuff. It's more of a gut health supplement now. That's yes. about as far as it goes. It's pretty much useless. Yes. Um, I wouldn't bother wasting your money on that. Also, BCAAs. Do not waste your money on BCAAs. They serve no purpose. Taking BCAAs once you reach your diet or your daily diet and take a protein makes no difference to muscle gain or anything performance-wise. So if you're hitting your protein, you don't need BCAAs. Plus, all your food and your whey protein has BCAAs in it. You don't need to take extra BCAs, so bear that in mind. But we'll finish this, up, finish this off by coming back to the training aspect. So again, we talk about lifting weights. There's multiple options depending on how much time you have. Um, if you are a busy dad, I highly recommend going down the abbreviated, ultra-abbreviated training route. This is taken from the all-time strongmen, the all-time physical culturists of the early and mid-1900s and even the late 1800s. And people just decided that this is no longer a thing and people aren't going to do it anymore, which is crazy to me. And these these guys got brutal. This was pre-steroid era. Dudes that were just lifting insane weights doing these kinds of training programs um, and not doing stupid amounts of volume and taking a whole lot of time. I mean, you might only have 20, 30, 40 minutes to train. These, these one lift or two lift a day programs are perfect if – you don't have the time and you can push these lifts hard because you're only training twice, three times a week and you're training so sh for such a short time, you can push them hard. For example, you might squat, just squat on one day. You might work up to a heavy one, two or three, not a max, just a heavy one, two or three. And then you'll do some back offsets, maybe 10, 20 or 30% uh, off, w remove that weight. And then you might start doing reps, five to 10 reps. You might do however many sets you, um, you can fit in that time. You might do two to four sets, whatever it is. That will be the entire session, and that would take you 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes. Something like that is super effective and far more effective than going to the gym and sitting on a machine and pumping out three sets of 10 on some leg press, and then moving on to leg extension, then moving on to leg curl, etc., and trying to fit all that into 20, 25 minutes. Just squat for that time, done. Next time you come in, you might do upper body. And with that body, you can superset it. You can do, maybe you're doing bench press or overhead press. You just superset every set with some pull-ups or chin-ups or rows or whatever it is. Something very simple. That's your session that you can use exactly the same set rep scheme. Work up to a heavy one, two, or three, and then do your back-off sets. That, if you are busy, is the most effective way to train.
and you'll get a lot done versus trying to pump a bunch of exercises and thinking, shit, I've only got 20 minutes. How am I going to get through all this? Um, plus the anxiety of actually seeing a program with three, four exercises and you have 20, 30 minutes, you just won't get it done. So abbreviated and ultra abbreviated training programs should be making a comeback. Um, that makes life a lot easier. And if you have more time, you can do that main lift, then you might finish with one more exercise, some kind of assistance exercise, an upper or lower body um, exercise, depending on what you're doing that day. Um, or whatever it is your goals are. Um, obviously, if you have more time to train, you can go on a traditional upper lower split, push pull legs, um, bro splits. You can do, but they're not as effective just because you're training the muscles only once a week. So a bro split would be like chest, the typical chest on Monday, back on Tuesday, legs on Wednesday, etc. Um, you're better off doing your training based on movements. So upper body, lower body, push or pull, et cetera. Um, you can do that kind of stuff too. Um, do you have anything to add there, Mona, on, on the training side? No, I feel like that was really good advice. <laughs> Perfect. Now, well, for everyone listening, please make sure to check out the link in the bio. Um, oh, actually, we've got, we've got a, uh, a comment here. Uh, there's, I, I, he's quoted me saying there's no supplement that will speed up your metabolism. And he's got brackets, red army soldiers popping two, four, I don't even know what that pill is. <laughs> Denitrophenol. Must be some kind of amphetamine for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, taking meth and stuff is probably going to help, but it's probably not going to be great for your health. So, yeah, I guess you could say there are some. I wouldn't call them supplements. They might be pharmaceuticals. But make sure you check the link in the bio. There's a free ebook for you there. It's the seven day kickstart fat loss challenge in there it gives you step one of the three step. Actually, it gives you all three steps, but it spells out step one in detail of how you can start to lose that dad bod very easily. And then it kicks on some other steps in there for you. But I think there's everything in this space. Mona, you got anything to add to finish or are we out? Nope. I think that we've actually covered everything, you know. And at the end of the day, you just have to remember that. Um, if you know, we just want to recap on some of the important things. It's like, you know, if you're wondering, you know, if you should work out or shouldn't work out, like go and look at your why. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's like point. one of the important things, like figure out like, why do you want to change? Because I feel like that's probably the best way that someone's going to actually stick to the plan and stick to yeah. their goals. That's a really good point. Um, but make sure you follow everyone up here just to, uh, keep seeing the content that's going to come through i think we're going to be i think we're going to do a space this saturday or next week with the carolina panthers strength conditioning coach i've invited him on um he's a friend of mine that is an is a strength conditioning coach for the, for the nfl team and we're going to bring him on to talk about building muscle and performance and all sorts of stuff so if that sounds interesting to you then make sure to give lift big e big a follow and I'll, I'll uh, schedule the space. It will either be Saturday or it will be Monday or Tuesday next week. But we're, we're pulling for Saturday uh, this week. So, yeah, make sure you give us a follow and we'll get that space scheduled. And we will see you in the next space.